Hello, it's Dr. Pig from Elisha's home here on Freedom Mountain in Fairdale, Pennsylvania. I uh, just want to welcome you and uh, just say that we're going to take a moment or two to let everyone get their coffee or their tea or their snack. And make sure you have your Bible and uh, a notebook and a writing utensil so that we can take lots of notes tonight. Uh, we're hoping to pick up where we left off last week, and uh, we're hoping that we're going to be able to give you some things to study through the week to keep you going until we meet again. Remember that uh, Pastor Rob or Pastor Tim will be here tomorrow evening at 7 with you, and then again on Friday evening, one of the pastors will be with you again, and then on Sunday morning, one of the pastors will be with you once again for our Sunday service. And so uh, I just want to say that, you know, here on the mountain, we've had a couple days of some nice spring weather, and now it's gotten a little chilly, but the sun's out. Praise God. We're enjoying the sun, and uh, I hear that there might be a little bit of some snowflakes coming this way, maybe just a touch, just enough to make us appreciate the spring days that we've had, but I want to encourage you to take time to, as the sun is out to uh, get out, get some fresh air, and uh, enjoy the sun. The vitamin D will do wonders for you. And you'll be able to have some time as you take a walk, just some quiet time with God. So I uh, just want to give a shout out to all of you that uh, have been coming each week. want to encourage you uh, to continue to invite friends and family. Remember that sheep beget sheep, and uh, right now it, we're kind of in the thick of the trial, and so there's many people that are discouraged, so I just want to encourage you to reach out to family and friends, and if you can get them to connect in, uh, maybe it will be uplifting to them, and uh, it will lift their spirit. So again, I want to welcome you. Uh, in a moment after we pray, we're going to pick up where we left off. Last week we had a moment that I'm sure you all got a really good chuckle from as I was going along and almost finished the message on my side on the computer. Big gray screen says, having trouble video recording. Your live session has ended. So we still had two more verses to go, but that's okay. It kind of kept us anticipating for this week. And uh, we'll pick up right there uh, when we're done praying in just a moment. Well, let's gather around the Word and begin with some prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time that we can come and we can commune with you. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your presence. Uh, as this week has been difficult, that there's, there's been many that have been a little more discouraged than maybe what they've been in the past. I ask, Heavenly Father, that you would continue to make your presence known to them. And uh, I ask, Heavenly Father, that you continue to speak to us and that our ears would be open so that we can further understanding in the spiritual realm and have revelation as to uh, the things that we need to know ahead of time. And I thank you, Lord. I thank you that you're there and that you're watching over us. I thank you for your protection. Uh, I just want to take time now to... Uh, lift up the seniors, um, the class of 2020. And, you know, as I was thinking of them the last couple of weeks, I began to realize that, you know, um, think of the things, Lord, that they'll be able to say in years to come about their class and the strength that their class has had to have to endure such a time as this something so unique that we've never experienced before. So, Heavenly Father, I lift up each senior, and I, I lift them up at the Lord, as I know that many of them are, have been considering college. Some made some definite decisions, and Lord, we know that at this time with uh, layoffs and um, jobs that have been postponed, we know, Heavenly Father, that there's many that are encountering financial difficulties. And so, Heavenly Father, you are the great provider, and so I ask, Heavenly Father, that you would uh, provide those needs. And I pray, Lord, that you would encourage those seniors that if they have a calling on their life and you've given them direction and guidance 
um, that they will continue to walk in that guidance, Lord, and have assurance um, that you are looking out for them and uh, that you're going to guide them and keep them safe and you're going to help them to achieve what it is that you have called them to in their young lives. I also think of uh, college students who've had to finish uh, their spring semester uh, at home and the difficulties that they have encountered. I pray, Heavenly Father, that you would give them wisdom also. I pray, Heavenly Father, that as they finish their finals this last week, and now they are in, quote, their summer break, uh, many of them are not feeling as though it's a break, as they are anxious and uh, insecure about what the future holds. I pray, Heavenly Father, that as the economy begins to open up, that many of those students that had jobs um, that were lined up, I pray, Heavenly Father, that those jobs would fall into place and that um, the students would be able to finish their education that they have started. And I ask, Lord, that you would place a, a, a blessing upon them and that you would encourage them to continue to follow that calling that you have laid on their lives. I also uh, stop to pause to uh, thank you, Heavenly Father, for the many medical um, individuals that words can't even express, I'm sure, what they have encountered. Um, medical school, I'm sure, has not prepared them for such a time as this. And so, Heavenly Father, I ask for an extra measure of your presence in those hospitals, I lift up the families who have uh, experienced loss. I pray, Heavenly Father, that if they don't know you, that during this difficult trial, this season, that you would place, um, you would place someone with compassion and mercy that would bring your love to those hurting individuals. I pray, Father, that during this time that there will be many that will be brought into your kingdom and that the wounds that are gaping would be closed and healed. Um, and you are the great physician, not just in our physical bodies, Lord, but in our emotional and in our spiritual. And so, Heavenly Father, I thank you for that. I thank you, Lord, for the encouragement that you are to me, and I thank you, Lord, for the message that you've given me this evening. I welcome your Holy Spirit, Lord, and uh, I ask that you would speak through me and uh, that I would be distinct in my um, presentation of your message. I pray, Heavenly Father, that, um, that you would speak boldly and that you would express what it is that you want us to hear this evening. And so with that time, we commit this time, Lord, um, to honor you and to glorify you. And again, we thank you for your word, the encouragement that it is to us, and the lifeline that it is to us, especially in this season. In your precious name we pray. Amen. So as I was saying earlier, last week, um, the lovely computer left me thinking that you all weren't there. And so I didn't finish the message because the uh, screen said that, uh, that offline, no longer doing a live. So with a little chuckle after we were all through it, a little disappointed that I didn't get to finish um, giving you the message. So we're going to go ahead and start there this evening just to tie up what we were talking about last week. We'll use it as a review to bring in those that might be new this evening and um, just to get everyone acclimated and ready for the message um, that God has given for us this evening. Remember that we have been studying the last several weeks, Psalms 119. It's known as the longest chapter in the Bible. And it's also known as an acrostic poem or an acrostic psalm, meaning that it has strategic placement of the Hebrew alphabet. Remember that the Hebrew alphabet is not like the American alphabet where it's a phonetical sound only. Each letter has a specific meaning or an expression. And so to learn those meanings will give us a deeper revelation of the scripture in those eight verses. So each week we've been studying just eight verses um, and chewing on those through the week. And then the next week we do eight more verses. So last week we were finishing up with the ninth 
uh, letter, which was Tate. And we said that in that particular scripture that um, we were going to finish with verse 71 and 72. I'm going to read that and then give you the transition into our lesson for this evening. So verse 71 and 72 of Psalms 119. It is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I may learn your statutes. The law of your mouth is better to me than thousands of coins of gold and silver. So I'm sure that all of us have gone through many trials the last few times that we've met. We've talked about looking over our lives and looking at some trials, some verses that we stood on, some things that God did for us so that we didn't just know, right? We've talked about our intellect and we've talked about knowing and then we've talked about acting out in our spirit. So in wisdom, there are things that God gives us in trials. and so. Do we look forward to the trials? No, not in the flesh, but we can testify that in those trials there are things that we learn and we can grab hold of those things and carry those with us so that when we come into another trial, we know what worked in the last one and we know what we can apply to this one and be ready for yet the next. And so looking at that, we also talked about how important and how valuable the word is and so if you recall the scripture is mentioned at least 171 times in the 176 verses in Psalms 119 think of the percentage of verses that speak of how important the word is in our life and so remember that the word we need to treasure we need it to be not just our intellect, our knowledge, our understanding, but it needs to come to wisdom, meaning that we're walking it out and we're actually having a relationship with Christ so that it is something that we're walking, talking, experiencing, so we then can pass it on to others, right? It's not just book knowledge where it's up here. And then it's not something that's just etched here, but then it's not acted upon, right? We want to act upon it. And so we thank the Lord for that. So our biggest concern is that we talked last week about, yes, we're in a trial. And when we um, invert the I and the A, we have T-R-A-I-L, which is trail. And this is a time that we are forging a trail to our new beginnings. And so this week has probably been one of the more difficult weeks um, as time goes on. And so we've seen more people discouraged. But we need to remember that, you know what, yes, the work might be difficult as we are forging that trail, but we never want to give up because all the work that you've done to get this far then is a waste. And when we get to the end of the trail, to the new beginning, to the new normal, we certainly don't want to give up what God has taught us and the things that we've looked at our life and said, you know, before we were just busy, 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 and God showed us that we needed to take time with our family or maybe we needed to make a change in our job. We certainly don't want to walk away from this time and have this season of trial or forging a new trail. We don't want to walk away and let the weeds of life take over what we forged so hard to get. Right? So when you forge a trail it's hard work but you don't just walk off and leave it you have to keep coming back right you have to do maintenance on it so we want to make sure that we're prepared to do the maintenance on that trail we never just walk off and just assume that oh well whatever we learned whatever and leave it behind us that's not that's not effective that's not wisdom okay that's not wisdom that's just where you have head knowledge and you just hung on to the rail, to you got to the end, and then you just went back to your old ways. We don't want to go there, right? Then it's a waste. We don't want it to be a waste. So this evening, if you'll um, look at verse 73 through 80 with me, we're going to be taking a look at the uh, tenth letter, and this particular letter looks like a comma, and it is a yod. It's a yod. 
Okay, the yod, the tenth letter, the Hebrew letter, represents the power of the Creator, the one true God, to create and govern. All right. So many of you look and you think, "Wow, with all this on, where is God?" It's the same place He's always been. He's still here, right? Where in the world? He's still here, still here, still creating, still governing. He hasn't gone anywhere. So the Yod, when we look at it a little deeper, the meaning is unity within multiplicity. So when we stop and think about multiplicity with God, we stop to think about the Trinity, right? We think about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. The unity within the multiplicity. All right? And how they operate together and they each have a specific purpose. So that in itself is an example to us. Right? So look at your family unit. It's a multiplicity. But if it's a family that's united, you operate, you each know what your specific giftings are. You know what your purpose is in your family. When you walk outside your family, your home, you know what your purpose is in God's kingdom. So tonight we're going to be talking about that. We're going to be talking about being fashioned in His image. And so oftentimes we talk about being fashioned in His image and we only talk about the nice thing. We talk about how we look and how we smell like God and, you know, just the, the surface things. But this evening we're going to talk about um, some attitude things, some attitude things. We're going to get to some inner workings of our characteristics that are like God. So first of all, we're going to start off with um, the NIV version. And then some of you have said that you enjoy the uh, Passion Translation. It helps you to understand it better. So we're going to read it in that. And then we're going to go through each verse and we're going to talk a little bit about each one. So I hope that you have your notebook. I have some really good notes for you this evening. Make sure that your pen is working because you're going to need it. All right. So let's take a look at verse 73. Your hands made me and formed me. Give me understanding to learn your commands. May those who fear you rejoice when they see me. For I have put my hope in your word. I know, Lord, that your laws are righteous. And that in my faith, in faithfulness you have afflicted me. May your unfailing love be my comfort, according to your promise to your servant. Let your passion come to me, that I may live, for your law is my delight. May the arrogant be put to shame for wronging me without cause. But I will meditate on your precepts. May those who fear you turn to me, those who understand your statutes. May I wholeheartedly follow your decrees that I may not be put to shame. And so that was the NIV. We're going to take a moment now and we're going to read it in the Passion. Starting in verse 73. Your very hands have held me and made me who I am. Give me more revelation light so I may learn to please you more. May I love your lovers May all of your lovers see how you treat me and be glad, for your words are entwined within my heart. Lord, I know that your judgments are always right, even when it's me you judge. You are still faithful and true. Send your kind mercy kiss to comfort me, your servant, just like you promised you would. Love me tenderly so I can go on, for I delight in your love, life-giving truth. Shame upon the proud liars. See how they oppress me, all because of my passion for your precepts. May all your lovers follow me as I follow the path of your instruction. Make me passionate and wholehearted to fulfill your every wish, so that I'll never have to be ashamed of myself. And so, I want us to stop and think for a moment. Um, Psalms 139 is a beautiful, beautiful chapter that speaks to um, how God created us and how he knows the number of the hairs on our head. And, you know, when you look at the, the scriptures where he says that he made me and fashioned me, 
and I began to ask myself, that seems like that's almost the same word, made and fashioned. But something that's fashioned, when we look it up in the dictionary, we find out that it's made into a particular or a required form. So I began to ponder on that and think, a required form in the image of God. So we were made in the image of God with a particular set of giftings, a particular personality, a particular person in a particular place in time. Hmm. So there's nothing really cookie cutter about that, is there? We don't all look the same. We don't all act the same, hopefully. In general, we have God's love and his characteristics. But we all have a different personality, right? He made some of us big. He made some of us small. He made some of us different colors, right? We all come from different countries, right, for a reason. Did you ever stop and ask yourself why you were born in the country you were born in? There's a reason. There's a reason. You just have to ask God about it. So I wanted us to just stop and, you know, take some time to ponder on that for a couple minutes. You know, who am I in Christ? And, you know, especially in this season, how am I going to use my personality? How am I going to use my giftings? What is it that God wants me to do? What can I do to make this an easier time for someone else? You know, it's a lot easier to get through a difficult time if we're not so busy looking at ourselves, me, myself, and I, but we're looking at others. What can we do for that neighbor what can we do for that elderly person? What can we do for the family member that maybe is having a bad day and really struggling? What can we do? Let's stop thinking about ourselves and begin to think about others. So I wanted us to stop and think about, um, you know, when the Creator created us and we were formed, we were formed into His image for a purpose. It was like a contract. We talk about... Um, the covenant, we talk about the old covenant in the Old Testament, we talk about the new covenant, we talk about the blood and all of the things that bind us to him and him to us. And so there's a certain part of that part of contract that we begin to think about our obligation, right? So when there's a contract, he has things that he's obligated to do for us. But then we're also obligated to do for him. And so I want you to chew on that this week. What is he obligated according to the promises in the book? What does he tell you that he will do for you? And then in response, what is it that you are to be doing for him? Right? And the first thing that comes off to my mind is obedience. Right? How important is obedience? It's pretty important. So I want us to really think about that. And then I want us to think about the importance of respecting him and what that actually means. Respect means admiration. So when you admire someone, you want to please them, right? You can't wait to jump in and to please them. So I began to really think about the root word of admire. And I sat for a little while and chewed on that. And I began to think about an admiral in the Navy. And of course, I'm not an expert on that. So I had to say to Pastor Rob, hey, tell me about an admiral. What should I know about an admiral in the Navy? I just remember the 33 days when we first got married that we were still in the military, or he was, and, you know, seeing the admirals walk by. Of course, I knew that they were to be revered and that they had a position of high authority, but really didn't know much beyond that. So he took some time to explain to me that an admiral uh, has a, a distinction as to their duty. Oftentimes it's a specific ship, and then that specific ship is assigned to a specific territory. All right? So when you think of God, God's like an admiral that's over all territories. All territories. An admiral. And so... There's a respect level. You know, when you're on a military base um, and you can just stand back and you can just see the respect 
and how they salute each other, how they carry themselves. There's a, desire, a sincere desire to be respectful and to honor and honor. And I don't think we do that enough just in our common, I think we've lost that to some degree. So that might be something that we could pray about. So the designer, when the designer is fashioning us, he has a vision, right? He doesn't just roll out the cookie dough and get the cookie cutter and just bam, 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 bam. Okay, I got a dozen cookies, right? No, there's a lot of thought that goes into it. Stop and think about your own package. You know, what type of personality do you have? Are you a caloric person? Are you a melancholy person? What giftings do you have? Are you an encourager? Are you a person that would like to be a wallflower? You know, all of those things he thought out methodically when he created you and he fashioned you. He fashioned you and prepared you for what he has for you to complete for the kingdom. Right? So we need to be asking God on a regular basis. Okay, as I am forging my trail, am I using my tools? Am I using my giftings that God has given me, right? And there's never a day that you put the toolbox in the tool shed, lock the tool shed, and walk away. Never, ever. Nope. That toolbox needs to be with you morning, noon, and night, everywhere you go. And you need to be ready and equipped to use your giftings to minister to others. So in this particular scripture, he asked God to give him understanding. And remember a couple weeks ago we talked about that you can have an intellect, a knowledge, and that's all it is. And, you know, you might think that that's impressive, but that's not impressive, right? Just because you can spout off, because you memorize the scriptures, and you can give a little piece of meaning, sorry, that's not impressive, all right? So that's knowledge, Understanding is when it's etched on your heart, and then we're getting a little better. But you know what's really impressive to God is when you let him take it one level further, and you have wisdom, and you are now speaking the word with a gentle heart of love, and you are his hands and feet on a daily basis, and you are reaching out to others, right? So we want to be that whole package. We want to have the knowledge have the understanding and we want to be using our hands so that we are allowing our spirit to carry out the wisdom that he has given us. All right, and verse 74, the common gladness of those who fear God. So stop and ask yourself, you know, when we talk about fear, um, many people like shake their heads and you know, they think of God like with a baseball bat, that type of fear. And that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about fear in the sense that there's a reverence, there's a respect, there's an honor, there's a, you know what, uh, he's way up here and I'm way down here. We're talking humility, recognizing that he's the, gr the great creator of the entire universe while we are just simple creatures that are here that are here to honor and to glorify him. Okay? So fear means that we have a fervent heart, meaning that we want to bring honor and glory and we want to please him. And that's our motivation. So then that scripture continues on because I have hoped in your word. And so we want to be an encouragement and a gladness to others. Have you ever gone into the grocery store and you meet up with someone that you have never met before and there's something in your spirit that connects with that person and you know before they even tell you that they're a believer and then you get to talking and it feels like you've known that person your whole life? Well, that would be because you have the commonality of Christ. And so you're a brother and a sister or two brothers or two sisters in Christ and you have a lot of common, common ground that you share that you share. And so, when we look at verse 75 to um, 77, we see that he begins to talk about the trial, the time of affliction, to be specific. 
and oftentimes uh, we don't really want to talk about that. We want to act like that that's never going to happen and sometimes we give the impression that you know when you get saved that it's like being in a rose garden and in actuality I think it's just the opposite because I think um, from my perspective that when you get saved Satan is threatened especially if you're going to be one of those sheep that's out there begetting sheep and bringing the sheep into the fold for the kingdom so then Satan feels threatened because he knows uh oh I gotta keep my eyeball on this one they're, they're serious they're gonna do the work that they've been called to do so noticing in the scripture your judgments are right in faithfulness you have afflicted me and so this is in faithfulness you have allowed me to go through trials and tribulations now we've talked about you know the potter's hand and how he uh, fashion the clay. We've also talked about the iron ore and how the temperature has to go up to 2000 and it has to be put in seven times before it gets hot enough. Right? So every time that you go through a trial or every time that you're a forging a new trail to a new beginning such as what we're going through now, the temperature is up pretty doggone high, wouldn't you say? And so when we come out of this, we should be better creatures for it right we've been under the temperature so under the fire when we come out we should be looking more polished than when we started so let me ask you this are you looking more polished or are you looking like you've been beat up a little bruised right if that's the case then you have to say to yourself okay what do I need to change what do I need to adjust right and so I want us to think that, you know, even when we're in the thick of this time, we need to be proclaiming the righteousness of God's judgment, even when we're in the midst, right? How many times have we said that, you know what, even in the thick of the battle, I'm going to praise God my praise is going to be so loud that they're going to hear me on the other mountaintop right even in the thick of it we need to be praising him in the season of trial right even in the thick of it all right so i want us to think about this um there are some bible characters that i can't go through the whole story with you but I want to give you some notes so that you can write this down or give you something to chew on this week. All right? Some of you might be saying, you know what, my devotion that I have, it lasts me a whole 15 minutes. But while I'm in a season like this, I need more than 15 minutes. I need an hour. I need two hours. I need four hours. Give me something, right? So I'm going to give you a little bit of a, um, some leftovers of our feast so that you can have something to spiritually study this week. So the first one that I want to talk about is Job. In Leviticus um, chapter 19, verse 28, we see that there's a pagan practice that is referred to. And so we all know that in Job chapter 1, verse 21, we see that Job says in the middle of the affliction of having lost 10 children, lost all of his um, people that take care of his animals, having lost all of his livestock, and this is what he says, blessed be the name of the Lord in the middle of all that, right? And so you stop and you say, whoa, was he not mourning? Yes, he was mourning tremendously. The loss of his children, the loss of his herd, the loss of his workers. And yet he still said, blessed be the name of the Lord. And so the one thing that we see in that time era in Leviticus chapter 19, verse 28, we see that when um, pagan people of that time were mourning, they would cut or they would tattoo themselves to honor the dead and that that was a common practice. We didn't see Job do that. Job stuck with his biblical principles and he didn't waver. He didn't waver. He was who he was before, yet he still was right so he was consistent no matter what no matter what the battle was no matter how much the heat was turned up right 
to ask you, the heat's been turned up. How you doing? Doing all right? Or do you need to fine tune some things? Then I want you to think about uh, David. Now, uh, David, I want you to look at 2 Samuel this week, chapter 16, verse 11. And this is what he said, let him alone and let him curse, for so the Lord has ordered him. So he was talking about Shiny, who was speaking badly towards him, and he was getting upset. But, you know, he could have been driven by emotion, but he wasn't driven by emotion. He kept his perspective, and he knew that this individual was not the issue. It was the things that he was saying, but what he was saying was correct in the sense that where the issue was, David's son, Absalom, had some heart motivation issues. And that's where the issue was. And so David had to keep himself focused and he had to what? Not sit in complacency, but he had to think about this and then he had to let his spirit rule and not sit and let his mind go over and over and over and nurse and rehearse. How many times do we get into a trial like maybe what we're in now that's been kind of extended? And how many times is it easy to call up five, six people and just nurse it and rehearse it and go over and over and over? Does that make you feel better? I doubt it. I doubt it. I doubt it very much. I think by the time you get done telling the sixth person, you just convince yourself just how horrible, horrible it is. And so at that point, you can't see any light at the end of the tunnel. You just buried yourself, right? So we don't want to nurse and rehearse it. We want to keep a proper perspective. We want to keep God's perspective. And so I want you to be able to uh, stay focused. Stay focused. So... He knew the real issue and the heart motivation and his very own biological son was the issue. And then we had a Shunammite mother and she was a good example and you might want to check out her story. In 2 Kings chapter 4 verse 26 we see that her son, uh, there was a miraculous reward. She had wanted a son so badly and so Elisha stayed up in her prophet's quarters and she had this young son, and uh, one day he was out in the field, and uh, bless his heart, he had like a heat stroke, and then he died. And so, of course, she went looking, right? She went looking for Elisha. She met up with Elisha's helper, and when he asked her if everything was okay, he could see the concern on her face, and she said, it is well. Well, was she saying, it is well that my son is laying there dead? No, she wasn't saying, it is well that my son is dead. She was saying, it is well, get out of my way. It is well, I've got to get to Elisha. I'm anticipating that if I can get to Elisha and tell him what happened, he will come and lay hands on my son and raise my son from the dead. And so what Elisha did was he sent his helper back and said to him, now when you get there, lay your cane over him or your staff over his face and declare life over him. and He should rise up. Well, Mama wasn't there. That wasn't her faith. She didn't know him. And so she couldn't put her faith in that this gentleman was going to be used to resurrect her son. And so it turns out that Elisha has to go back and he breathed life in him. So, you know, when we say it is well, it might not mean that we mean that it is well for a long extended. It might be, it is well for the moment that I anticipate that God's going to take care of this. So we might say, it is well in this forging season. It is well for today. But you know what? As time goes on, it's not going to be so well because I'm expecting God to come and to intervene and to, what, take care of it right? We anticipate. We anticipate. If you don't anticipate, then there's no reason to get out of the bed. Just stay in the bed. Don't get up in the morning. There's no reason, right? 
If you don't anticipate, that means you have no hope. And if you have no hope, then life's going to be really difficult and quite a challenge. So I want you to be able to look at 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 26 and study out that story a little further. Again, we don't have a whole lot of time, so there's a whole lot of stuff I could tell you about each of those stories. But just wanted to give you a glib to whet your appetite, to give you something that you'd want to jump in and um, go ahead and get started on studying. So, um, you know, the one thing that I want you to remember is that when you're anticipating, you want to keep moving, making progress, looking forward, and you don't want to stay stuck, right? You don't want to stay stagnant. So every day you need to be renewing your mind. You need to be asking God to show you something new, right, that's going to project you forward, right? We don't want to be hanging off the side of the cliff, right? That's not where we want to be. We want to be making strides forward in our foraging, right? And the only way we're going to do that is to concentrate on the Word. So then in verse 78 to 80, um, we see the contrast between those that are the proud and those who fear God. And in verse 78, let the proud be ashamed. And so as he's praying, he's saying to God, you know, I've been mistreated horrifically, wrongly, right, wrongly. There's been falsehood stated about me. My reputation has been, has that ever happened? Where someone said something and you think, yikes. That's my reputation, and that's not true. It's not anywhere near true. So then what do you do? Do you go try to take care of it yourself? No, you ask God to go ahead and take care of it. And so I want you to really think about that. Have you ever been in that situation before? And how did you deal with it? Did you deal with it well? Did you deal with it scripturally? Or is there something that you needed to tweak? And so we often see that, you know, like when we study out... Um, Hezekiah, uh, this is an interesting one. I want to take a moment to try to give you just a, a tidbit, but I want you to study this week, 2 Kings chapter 19, verse 14 through 16. That is the um, cherry on top of the Sunday in, the, in this story. And I want you to think about Hezekiah. I'm going to give you a little bit of the story just to get you going, whet your appetite, but Hezekiah was the king of Judah. And he was smack dab in the middle of where the Assyrian um, armies were attacking. And the Assyrian army was very powerful. It was a huge army. And uh, they had some pretty keen ways of fighting in their battles. And so remember that um, Hezekiah's capital was the fortress city of Jerusalem. And so we find that um, he's hearing reports of cities that have been um, breached and burned and none of them have been able to sustain and to hold back the Assyrian army. So the people that are under him, they have become very hopeless. And so they just keep saying to him, you're going to get us killed. You're going to get us killed. There's no way that we're going to be able to fight off the Assyrians. And so he would say to himself, as a believer of Yahweh, the one true God, he will save us. And that's what he would tell his people. He will save us. And so you couldn't have, in those days, found a more desperate time, a more bleak time, or a time that was more filled with violence. And so in 701 B.C., we see that the Assyrian army is marching towards Jerusalem, and they're coming, and they're coming, and Hezekiah, for quite some time, was anticipating that this was going to happen, right? So if he just sitting on his couch praying, okay, God, you just do your thing. Go ahead, do your thing. Mm -hmm. The next day, okay, God, go ahead, do your thing. I'm watching. Yep. Just watching. No, that's not what he did. He prayed, right? And he listened. And as he listened, God would give him wisdom as to what to do. So in Second Kings chapter twenty, verse twenty, we see that uh, he began by tunneling a shaft through uh, one thousand seven hundred forty-eight 
feet of solid rock. Imagine 1,748 feet of solid rock to supply water to the city in the time of the siege. I mean, that's tremendous even in this time, but think, Lake. Wow. And then in Second Chronicles chapter 32, verse 1 through 4, we see that he's going out and he's having his men stop up the springs around Jerusalem for the purpose that those water supplies could supply water to the attacking Assyrian army. So he's going to plug them up, right? So if I can't beat you down mil mil militarily, then I'm going to go ahead and dry up the water source. If I dry up the water source, you're dehydrated and die. Okay. It's creative, right? It's wisdom. And then in uh, Second Chronicles chapter 32, the first, por the first portion of verse 5, we see that he is working on extending and strengthening the wall of Jerusalem. And then uh, in the last part of that verse, we see that he's increasing the production of shields and weapons. And then in verse 6, we see that he's organizing a combat force. And so he's preparing. He's anticipating what's going to happen strategically. And so he's not just sitting on his couch just praying, right? He's not expecting God to do it all. Yes, he's asking God for guidance and for wisdom. But he's saying to God, okay, what do I need to do? Show me. Okay, I'm going to do that today. All right, I'm going to go get the men to go do this part. And these men over here do this part. And over here. So he's organized. He's God giving him a vision. And he's carrying out that vision for a Assyrian army that's come in their direction. And so then he receives a letter. And it's an upsetting letter about what's coming. And so what does he do? Does he, like, rip it up, throw it in the garbage, and get upset? No. He goes to the table. He spreads it out. And he calls a meeting with God. And he reads it to God. And then he observes what's in it. And then he asks God to what? Give him further wisdom to be able to anticipate yet what could be up yet still. And so then at that, God tells them to go and encourage the people. And so in Second Chronicles, verse 32, verse 7 and 8, this is what he says. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of the king of Assyria and the vast army with him, for there is a greater power with us than with him. With him is only the arm of flesh, but with us is the Lord our God to help us and to fight our battle. So, Whose battle is it? It's God's battle. It's God's battle. And we're there as the, what? The pawns to do what he needs us to do. The only way we're going to know what he needs us to do is for us to what? To meet with him on a daily basis throughout the day. To listen for that still small voice. And then to be obedient in a timely fashion. In John 1, 4, 4, we are reminded the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. Sometimes I think we lose sight of that when in the thick of the battle. So it's super important that we remember that this is the battle of the Lord. Right? This is his battle. And we are there to be obedient. We are there to carry out what he needs us to do. So we need to anticipate the strategy that's yet up ahead. So we need to be praying for our governors. We need to be praying for the CDC. We need to be praying for our president. Uh, we need wisdom. And, you know, some of them may not know God. And so we need for them to quiet in their spirit and to listen in regard to whether they know it's God but they'll know that they know that they know. And so I just want to encourage us in that. Now this is the prayer that Hezekiah prayed. It's in 2 Kings chapter 19, verse 15 through 19. I'll say it again so you can write it down. 2 Kings chapter 19, verse 15 through 19. 
O Lord, God of Israel, enthroned between the cherubim, you alone are God over all the kingdoms of the earth. You have made heaven and earth. Give ear, O Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, O Lord, and see. Listen to the words of seven cherubim has sent to insult the living God. It is true, O Lord, that the Assyrian kings have laid waste these nations and their lands. They have thrown their gods into the fire and destroyed them. For they were not gods, but only wood and stone, fashioned by men's hands. Now, O Lord our God, deliver us from his hand, so that all kingdoms on earth may know that you alone, O Lord, are God. And so as I stopped to ponder on that specific prayer, began to ask myself, okay, what is it that we should be praying? You know, we've got all of those general things for wisdom, comfort, and all that good stuff, but this is the season that we need to be asking God to set it up, to deliver us from this plague of this virus, and that as we're walking through this and we're forging the new trail, that when we get to the end of the trail, everyone will know that it was God, right? You know, it's interesting because the scientists, bless their hearts, they're doing the best they can possibly do. And the medical doctors are doing everything they can possibly do. But notice that's man, right? We need God to show up on the scene. We need God to show up on the scene. And when he does, then to give him credit that is due him as the great physician. Right? So, then in verse 80, as we conclude, it says, Let my heart be blameless regarding your statutes. So, as he compares himself with the proud who spoke lies, he still uh, recognizes his need for greater obedience to God. And so that is a humble person who's looking to um, keep himself in check with who God wants him to be. So he comes to God and he asks God to help him in that. And he, he says to God, you know, I depend on you to help me to see, to be honest with myself who I truly am. And so he asked the Lord to show him his own heart and his own life. You know, sometimes you can go before the Lord and ask the Lord to show you something and he can show you and you don't see it. You know why? As you're sitting there saying, okay, God, show me. Go ahead, show me. And you have your hands over your eyes. You're saying it with your mouth, but you really don't want to see because you're afraid that you're not going to like what you see. So, if you don't like what you see, change it, right? It's a simple repentance. You know what, Lord? I see that I have been slack in this area. Or I see that my heart hasn't been right in this area. So, I bring that before you, Lord. I ask you to forgive me. I ask you to be there as a reminder that when I tend to go in an unsteady way because it's what's familiar, I ask that you would remind me that, uh-uh, it's not the way we operate. That's not where we go. This is a new trail, a new beginning, a new norm, right? A new norm. So in the New Testament, there's many examples of people where their hearts were not blameless. And so again, if you want something more to study, I'm going to dish it up. So I hope you have your, your pen and your paper, all right? So the first one that didn't have a blameless heart would be Judas. Judas. And we see that in Matthew chapter 26, verse 14 through 16. Do you want to study out Judas? He's an interesting character. You'll be able to learn a awful lot about his heart and what led him to the demise that he ended in. And then there's Ananias and Sapphira. And you can read about them in Acts chapter 5, verse 1 through 11. And then there's Alexander in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 20. And then there's Demas. Demas in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10. And he's not a real common one, but you might want to read it. You might find it interesting. Right? So those are just some examples 
of some biblical characters that their hearts were not blameless. And so in Psalms 139, we were saying that, you know, um, God knows the hairs on our head. We were fashioned in his image. And so we want to remain as such, right? We want to say to God, we want to be blameless, Lord. Show us. Show us. And so in the 23rd verse of Psalm 139, the psalmist says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. So as he searches, he will reveal, right? And then you have to say to yourself, am I ready for what he's going to reveal? And do I really want him to reveal it to me? Am I going to do something about it? Or am I just going to slough it off and make 101 excuses for why I still continue to do this or that? Right? We all have something to work on. Trust me, we all do. And so it's real easy when he shows you something. Say, well, but we always have a big but that sticks up right there, right? So you know what? Let's just dip and listen. And when he's all done showing us, then it's time to take a breather, take some time, think, ponder, and then come on bended knee and ask him to forgive us and then show, ask him to show us the error of our ways. So, in verse 80, that I may not be ashamed. Is there a part of your life that you're ashamed? Right? Is there a need to be ashamed? Maybe it's not about being ashamed so much as it's one of those things where have we repented? Right? If we've repented, it's forgiven from as far from the east to the west God doesn't remember that you did it unless you bring it back up all right so sometimes it's not about God forgiving you it's about you forgiving yourself right have you ever done something or said something and you like I just can't believe that I did that or that I said that and you go over it and over it and over it and as the years go by it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. It's easier if when we do something that we just immediately, as soon as we recognize that it's wrong, just simply go on bended knee before the cross and say, You know what, Lord? I'm so ashamed and I'm so disappointed in myself and I ask you to forgive me. Please show me the error of my way. Please correct me. Remind me so that I don't repeat this sin again, right? So we don't want to be ashamed. There's no need to be ashamed, right? We ask God. He forgives us. He loves us. He's a merciful God. He's a merciful God. He instantly forgives. Instantly forgives. Hmm. So we want to be forging a trail to a life that's lived unashamed right so when we get to the end we don't want to have anything that we're ashamed of we want to look back and say hey you know what if there was a sin I went to the base of the cross I took care of it I asked the Lord to forgive me pleaded the blood over it it's been covered as though it never existed and so there's no portion of our life that we need to be ashamed of because God loves us and he wants to forgive us so we want to be asking God to have a healthy life before him and these are some things that I want you to ponder this week we want to ask God let me be comforted by your kindness right we serve a kind God not a God that's an angry God with a baseball bat right we serve a loving, compassionate God. A loving and compassionate God. And we say to him, let us live by his mercies. When the sun rises out, do you recognize that it's a new page? A brand new page? A brand spanking new page. A new page in your life to be totally written anew. Right? New mercies. Whatever happened yesterday, it's under the blood if you ask. Right? Today's a new day. Today's a new day. 
And then, let me be in the presence of those who fear you. So let me have companionship with those that are of your flock to be encouraged, to be lifted up, to be instructed, right? To have a joyous fellowship, right? That's going to boost me in my walk and give me further energy to forge my trail to my new beginning. So I ask you, who are you hanging with? Are you hanging with somebody that's going to speak words of comfort from the scripture to you? Or are you speaking somebody that's only going to nurse and rehearse? Right? There's only so much you can listen to that before you start buying into that and believing that yourself. Right? It's like walking up behind a dump truck and knowing that the little beep, 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 and it's coming up and all the trash is going to fall out and you're just going to stand there under a shower of trash. Really? That's not where we want to be. We want to be in companionship with those that believe that are like-minded. And like-minded fellowship boosts us, right? It elevates us to the, what? To the fellowship, to the faith of God, right? So our very last response to God would be, let my heart be blameless. And in order to be blameless, we have to be open to hear and to see what he's going to show us, right? And we can't run from whatever he shows us. We have to be ready to say, yes, Lord, I have failed in that area. Please forgive me and ask for forgiveness. And it comes instantly. We don't have to beg for it. We don't have to do ten whatevers for it. All we have to do is ask for it. And immediately forgiveness comes. So I just want to encourage you to remember that you have been made in the image of God. You've been fashioned in the image of God for a purpose. For a purpose. And so as you forge your trail, your trail is in preparation for a new beginning, a new season. And so I say to you, whatever your tools are that you've got in that toolbox, get used in them, right? Don't let them get rusty. Don't let them get dusty. Get them out and start using them. This is the time to be using, right? There's so many people that could use your gifting, right? Even if you have to put your little face mask on, right? Put your little gloves on if need be. Stand your little six feet, whatever, whatever the standard is. Okay, whatever. I can do that, right? It might not be as comfortable as it typically would be, but... You know what? If that's what it takes, I'll put the face mask on and I'll do my business and I'll bless and I'll minister. Right? Little face mask, gloves if need be, whatever it takes. Right? Get the tools out. Get get them. Get the dust blown off. Get the rust off of them. Get going. Right? Get forging your trail to a new beginning. All right? When we get through this season. I can't wait to hear some of the testimonies of some of the things that have happened during this time. Some of you have left us know, and then there's others of you, I'm sure, that you are keeping a journal, and you are journaling, and when you get back to the fellowship, you're going to be letting us know some awesome things, and you're going to be ready to testify of those awesome things that God's been doing. All right? So... We're going to pray and we're going to ask God to bless you for another week. Remember that uh, tomorrow evening one of the pastors will be here uh, at 7 o'clock with you. And uh, if you have a prayer need or you have a need, you know that you can call the ministry office and we will help you in any way that we can or we'll guide you to find the help that you need. All right? So let's bow in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for the many characters in your Bible that show us the many trials um, that one might go through. And just the examples, Lord, of um, those that were blameless, but, Lord, also those that were not blameless. And so we thank you, Heavenly Father, that you love us and uh, that you are willing to forgive us in an instant. And 
We thank you, Lord, that you're watching over us and um, that you care for us and um, our wellness. Our wellness is important to you, and we thank you for that, Heavenly Father. I pray, Lord, for each of those that are joining tonight with me. I pray, Lord, uh, I had your protection about each one of them and their families. I pray, Heavenly Father, that the angels would stand guard over each of them, that they would be protected, and that their entire wellness, their entire prosperity, uh, the wellness of their body, their finances, their property, um, that you would watch over them, Lord, and that they would know that your thumbprint is on their life and that you are helping them to forge this new trail to their new beginning. And so, Lord, we rejoice in that. We give you honor and praise and glory for that. Heavenly Father, we look forward to the next time that we can gather together and to share about your word. We ask now that you would bless each person, that you make your presence known to them, as they go on in their week, Lord, we ask that you bring them back again next week uh, to join again and to partake of your word again. In your precious name we pray. Amen. Well, I have to say goodbye for today. I hope that I will see you again uh, next week. Take care and be blessed.